This is a video lecture continuation from a, a previous lecture that was part of a series introducing uh, diodes uh, from a circuit perspective. And in that first lecture, we talked about the ideal diode characteristics, basically a diode operating as a switch, either being open or closed. We introduced the Shockley equation model, which uh, relates uh, voltage to current of a diode through an exponential equation. We then looked at the IV characteristics of a real diode, a 1N4148, compared it to the Shockley diode equation and found that for higher currents we needed to add in some series resistance to better uh, model the actual physical diode. And then we uh, lastly uh, actually looked at data for the 1N4148. We extracted from the data, from the, of the data sheet, uh, the parameters of the Shockley equation, uh, N and IS, in addition, the series resistance RS, and we use those to produce a SPICE model, diode model, which we then used in a simple SPICE circuit simulation to produce or replicate the IV curve, and found that that IV curve um, replicated pretty well the IV curve that was found in the data sheet. In this lecture, I want to present several simple diode models, but uh, before doing that, I wanted to, to once again pull up the data sheet of the 1N4148 and uh, just point out a few other uh, physical limitations or things you should be looking at uh, when you go to use a diode in an actual circuit. You want to look at the data sheet for the part. There's a lot of information in it, but uh, you can quickly learn uh, quite a few things about a device by doing so. I'm not going to point everything out, but I'll give you a quick overview. So every data sheet, uh, for every data, semiconductor data sheet, you will have an absolute maximum rating table. It's usually at the beginning of the data sheet, and it will. these are things you don't want to violate. You don't want to go beyond this. Typically, you don't want to operate the device anywhere near these limits, but these are the absolute limits. So for a diode, those limits are a maximum repetitive reverse voltage. In this case, it's 100 volts. Okay, That's analogous to saying there's a maximum working pressure for a check valve. Remember, I used that analogy in the first lecture. So when the check valve is blocking water flow in the reverse direction, it will block it up to a certain pressure, and beyond that, the valve may fail. So maybe it's 100 PSI, maybe whatever. But uh, for the diode, it's, uh, the, the blocking is a voltage rating. Typically, when you design a circuit and you put in a diode, or this is true for any semiconductor, as a rule of thumb, uh, you don't want to go beyond about 80% of the rated voltage. So I would not use a 1N4148 in a circuit that would ever apply more than 80 volts across uh, that diode, even though it's rated for 100 volts. Okay, secondly, there is a maximum rectified forward current, so that's how much forward current can flow through on average through your diode. That's tied to power dissipation, so when there's current flowing, there's voltage, and the VI product produces power. So for instance, if there's two volts across this diode at this current level, uh, then that would be 2 times 0.2, that would be 400 milliwatts of power. Down here, uh, in the next table, you see that there's a limit of 500 milliwatts as the maximum power dissipation. And uh, a lot of times you're limited to less power than that, and I'll speak to that in a minute. Uh, going down further on the absolute maximum rating table, sometimes if, if your a current is not a DC current, but it's varying in time, then there is you want to pay attention to what's called a recurrent peak forward current. And uh, that in this case is 400 milliamps. So for instance, what if you had a pulse, a current that was going through your diode that had an amplitude of 400 milliamps, and it was on for one second, off for one second, on for one second, off for one second. Okay, the average would be 200 milliamps, which would be right at the absolute limit for average forward current. And your repetitive peak current would be 400 milliamps, which would be right at the limit here as well. So that's how you would uh, use these numbers. You want to stay below those. If you're looking at just hitting this, uh, you know, having pushing a lot of current through the diode in a non-repetitive way, then uh, if you could uh, you could go as high as four amps if it was limited to one microsecond. 
So an example of this might be, you know, in a in, fl in a camera where you have a flash. Let's say that uh, you know you had a circuit when when you discharged the the high voltage capacitor in there to through the through the discharge lamp. If current was actually flowing through a diode in that case, perhaps you could use uh, you'd use a spec like this where you'd say, okay, my my flash is only you know going on for a microsecond or for you know a millisecond. I don't need and, and, and if the current is say three amps during that discharge, I don't need to buy a diode that can handle an average forward current of three amps because this is only happening for a very short time. Furthermore, I don't need a diode that can handle this on a periodic basis because you're not flashing the camera you know, on a repetitive basis. Yeah, you do it repeatedly, but it's really aperiodic. There's a long time between flashes. It's important to know also that the, uh, any semiconductor has a maximum operating junction temperature. And a lot of times in, in semiconductors, this is going to be somewhere between 150 and 175 degrees C. So if things go above there, don't be surprised if your device fails. Also, the characteristics, the behavior of your device really falls apart, really degrades as, uh, as the temperature gets, gets higher. So to help you um, estimate your power dissipation or, or temperature, they give you this uh, this thermal resistance, okay, which they call here junction to ambient thermal resistance, and they say it's 300 degrees C per watt. What that means is that if you were to dissipate one watt of power in this device, the temperature rise between the junction, that is the actual point on the silicon wafer where the like the N and the P type silicon come together to form the diode junction, right on that surface there, the temperature would be 300 degrees higher than the ambient temperature surrounding the diode. So if the ambient temperature is 25 degrees, then the junction would actually be 325 degrees. So now it might make sense why they limit the power dissipation to 25 to 500 milliwatts. 500 milliwatts times 300 degrees per watt gives you 150 degrees C. And if you're operating in an ambient of 25 degrees, then the junction temperature would be, you know, 150 plus 25 or 175, and that is the maximum operating temperature for this semiconductor. Again, typically you don't want to go this high. You want to put some margin in. If we move on to uh, second page, there's a table of electrical characteristics, which are usually, uh, you know, some some um, more accurate data points that you might see later in one of the figures, but here they actually give you uh, numbers and a lot of times they'll give you limits. So for instance, if you had 5 milliamps flowing through your diode, you can know that the voltage across your diode is going to be no more than 720, All right, no more than 720 and no less than 620. Okay. Reverse leakage. Another thing you need to know is that when you think the diode is off and not carrying cur conducting current, it is conducting current. There is always a little leakage current. Now it may be negligible, but it may not. It depends on uh, what you're trying to do. Let's say you have a capacitor that's charged and you have a diode that's in parallel with that capacitor and the diode is in parallel in such a way that the diode should be off and you think, ah, the capacitor is not going to discharge. Well, if there's a little leakage current, it's kind of like having a little drip of a leak in your water tank over time. Long, if you wait long enough, the water will empty out of that tank, or at least the water level will go down to a point that's non-negligible. So here they give you a couple uh, data points. At 20 volts reverse voltage and room temperature, I should mention that notice up here, these are all at room temperature, unless otherwise stated. At room temperature, uh, there is a reverse current of 25 milliamps, nanoamps, I'm sorry, 20, 25 billionths of an amp. Sounds really small. If you have that same 20 volts, but now the, the temperature is 150, not 25, this current goes up by 2,000 times to um, 50 microamps, okay? 
So that's something you want to keep in mind. Uh, if you are really counting on the diode being totally off and not conducting current when it's reversed, you want to look at the data sheet and see whether this leakage current is something that will affect your circuit. <clears throat> it's good to know also in circuits where the diode is switching on and off, it's not just kind of statically on, that the capacitor has some capacitance in parallel with it. It's part of the physical structure. It's a parasitic element. You can't avoid it. So for this little diode, it's, it's quite small. It's two picofarad. But again, if you were switching this diode at, you know, a gigahertz, then that two picofarad would be significant. Another thing you should know about diodes is that if you're turning them on and off, uh, it does take some finite amount of time to actually turn the diode off. Not very long, but depending on how fast you're trying to switch things, it could be significant. This diode turns off quite quickly in four billionths of a second. Okay. Now there are tables, figures, that are useful. And we looked at some of these last time. So here in figure one is the, um, the reverse voltage. No, we didn't look at that. I'm sorry. We looked at figure three and figure four. Uh, actually, we looked at figure four and five. Figure three, four, and five are all forward voltage versus forward current, but they're on different scales. So the first one is 1 to 100 microamps, then, then 100 microamps to 10 milliamps. So I won't say anything more about those, but they're on a semi-log scale, so that's why the line should be straight. Um, but when you get up to the higher current, recall that it ceases to look straight and it curves upward and that's due to ohmic resistance so that's why we added a additional resistance to our Shockley diode uh, model. Let me go back to figure one. So here is reverse voltage versus reverse current and what this shows is that as you reverse the voltage across the diode um, and you apply more voltage you'll actually have a current that increases okay and that is shown on both the log scale semi-log scale and on the linear scale here on figure two so you can see how figure two uh, notice as you get closer and closer to 100 volts that current really starts rising exponentially speaking of reverse uh, current let me see maybe it doesn't show that uh, okay take that back. Let's look at figure 6. Another interesting characteristic of a diode is that its forward voltage, which here you're plotting forward voltage versus forward current, is that that changes uh, with temperature. So uh, we looked at, um, typically we'll look at the room temperature uh, curve, but notice that if the diode is colder than room temperature, its forward voltage will actually increase and if the diode gets hot the forward voltage actually decreases in fact it decreases by about two millivolts per degree C so the hotter the diode gets the uh, uh, the lower the voltage across it okay and uh, if you think about it that is one of the reasons that's the main reason why we do not parallel diodes like we parallel uh, resistors. If you parallel diodes hoping that current will split between them, it turns out that the diode that gets hotter actually has less voltage and hogs more of the current uh, and then gets hotter yet because more current flows and so you, you soon have a runaway situation and uh, one of the diodes fails. Okay, here in figure 7 is uh, capacitance and capacitance for a diode is actually not constant. It actually changes with the reverse voltage and uh, again I'm just pointing this out just as kind of a quick tour of what you might need to know about a diode depending on the application and I mentioned previously that the diode does not turn off in uh, zero time so uh, notice that depending on how much current was flowing through the diode the time it takes for the diode to recover uh, changes. So the more forward current that you have, uh, the quicker it can actually switch off. So at 60 milliamps forward current, looks like it can turn off in about one and a quarter nanoseconds. But if you're only at 10 milliamps, when you go to try to take turn off, it'll take you three and a quarter nanoamps. 
Okay, and then lastly here, uh, figure nine shows uh, basically a derating for the average current versus temperature. So if you recall the, the maps, absolute maximum uh, ratings for the diode said that uh, an average forward current of 200 milliamps was acceptable, but that's not uh, acceptable for any ambient temperature. It is acceptable only for temperatures up to 25 degrees. Above 25 degrees, you have to derate things, right? And you have to derate because uh, the junction temperature is going to, you know, basically increase proportionally or, or, or equally um, in proportion to whatever the ambient temperature increases by. So uh, by the time you get to 150 degrees junction, you can only handle, it looks like, about 75, no, uh, maybe 37 milliamps. And that's because you only have 25 degrees of margin between ambient and junction, right? Because the maximum junction temperature is 175. Um, uh, similarly, figure 10 shows a power derating. There are two curves because there are several packages. The DO35 is the one that you'll see in lab. It's this leaded one here. Um, and the SOT23 is a little surface mount guy. But uh, again, you see 500 milliamps uh, down between 0 and 25 degrees C. But above 25 degrees C, there's a derating. So don't just assume. If you see a data sheet that says this device has a power dissipation of 500 milliamps, milliwatts, that it means 500 milliwatts at any ambient temperature. No, it only means 500 milliwatts at room temperature. And usually electronics don't operate just at room temperature. All right, well, there's a tour of a diode data sheet. And uh, although there's probably a lot in here that uh, quickly went by and uh, maybe you don't can't quite make sense of it, at least hopefully you have a, a good overview of uh, kind of the different uh, real specs that are associated with the typical diode. And in conclusion, when we return now to our diode models, uh, what we want to recognize is the only thing that we're going to model in our diode model is just the DC um, VI characteristics. Okay, so you can see here that there's a lot more involved in the diode than just that, but we're not going to worry about any of those other things. We're not going to worry about the uh, the capacitance, we're not going to worry about the switching time, we're not going to worry about breakdown voltage, we're not going to worry about maximum power dissipation or junction temperature, we're not going to try to um, model uh, how the diode VI characteristic changes with temperature. Uh, we're going to use a pretty simple model. And yet, uh, a model like that can still be very useful in designing real circuits. So we're not, we're not limited uh, to just, you know, classroom exercises. Um, you can use the models that we will develop uh, for actually doing real design, but you have to always keep in mind that there, there are unanswered questions with that model, and you will have to consider those um, in addition to uh, whatever insights you gain from using that simplified model.